In our readings of late, full of signs and wonders, we seem to have been involved in quite a lot of eating, from the dramatic banquet in Herod's palace, an occasion of sordid behaviour and death-dealing, to picnics in the countryside, attended by huge crowds, life-giving occasions that never tire my imagination. Now, last week, we reached the midpoint of John's seven signs. And today, we pick up the story when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. So they hop into boats and sail to Capernaum looking for Jesus. They had on the lake to carry 5,000 people. Well, when they find Jesus, they don't seem to comprehend who he is. At least there's a hint of that. Rabbi, they ask, when did you come here? The scene is set for yet another I saying to appear. Yet another of John's dazzling insights. And Jesus replies to the crowd, somewhat caustically in my view, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Now, last week Desiree remarked to us uh, about an insight that Raymond Brown wrote actually in uh, his uh, commentary published in 1966. He wrote, um, an illuminating comparison of the dialogue in today's gospel text and the conversation between the woman at the well. Now our text today offers bread and two key sentences. Do not work for the food that perishes. Followed by, sir, give us this bread always. And then in the woman at the well, you might remember, runs a close parallel with water. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Followed by, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, that's a kind of thematic repetition, repetition that, that we have, and that's very common in John, uh, throughout his gospel, in fact. And thus, he frequently uses the phrase, very truly, I tell you. It always makes me think of the King James Version, verily, verily, I say unto you, very truly, I tell you. Now, very truly, or all the other variations that I've no doubt we've heard, is the translation of the Greek word Amen, from which, of course, we get our English word Amen. And it is a particularly striking emphasis marker used in our scriptures to introduce statements of pivotal significance. So certainly in John, who uses it a lot, you know you're going to get something that is vital to his message after very truly I say to you. Not for sure, or absolutely, or definitely. And that element of certainty is crucial to our understanding of John's use of Amen. On Jesus' lips, it speaks to an assurance that his message is, as it were, guaranteed by God. For Jesus is both the messenger and the actuality conveyed by the message. For John, then, there is no confusion. Jesus is the bread of life, is the water of life, and at the same time is something greater than life as we know it. That is to say, our own lives, 
are not complete in themselves. My life, wrote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is outside myself, beyond my disposal. My life is another, a stranger, Jesus Christ. In John, Jesus is life itself and has come so that they may have life. The purpose of John's Gospel is clearly enunciated so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that, certainly for me, leads me to consider yet another important word, believe. I, um, it's a bit of a fuzzy word uh, in the Western world these days. You know, I can say, well, I believe you, yeah? Or somebody will ask me, do you believe in? Yeah? Do you believe in the gospel? Do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in God? Um, do you believe that this coffee is uh, made with real coffee this morning? And so on. So, it's a fuzzy word. Now, the Greek for the word that's translated in our gospel, believe, is pistis, which is also the name of the Greek goddess of trust, honesty, and good faith. She was one of the good spirits to escape Pandora's box and promptly fled back to heaven, abandoning humankind. So, belief for John is, is a weighty word. Now, that's what he was familiar with. And it's unfortunate that in the Western world, the word belief has escaped the rigor of its origins. Now, let's move to the Old Testament reading for a moment. You may remember the line from last week's Gospel. Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Now, there's a similar dynamic in the Old Testament in which God is constantly testing the people of God. He doesn't test all the others. God deals with people in general with understanding and compassion. But when it comes to the covenant people of God, there's a repeated theme of critique and testing throughout. And we have a perfect example of that in our Exodus reading when, quote, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. God's response was to say to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them. Now, the bit that was missed from our reading uh, is how they fail that test. Um, because they go out and gather more than enough for that day, and the food rots overnight. Now, in essence, God then says th three things to Moses. First, God has heard their complaints. He listens. Second, she, God, sorry. Second, in response to their complaining, God will provide for the people meat, quails in the evening, and bread, manna, in the morning. And third, God tells Moses that it is when the people access God's provision of food, then they will know who the Lord is their God. Our Gospel text 
says roughly the same thing. Except that Jesus attunes his listeners to God's faithfulness this very day, today, in this very moment. The crowd demands, sir, give us this bread always. But what they demand is actually what they already have. In the actual presence of Jesus, they already have that. I am the bread of life, said Jesus. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Scholar and preacher Walter Bregman notes a multitude of meanings for bread. Bread has to do with the entire system of creation from the management of water and soil, to the breeding of good seed, to the economies of the world. Every culture and economic class consumes bread, and if it is not shared, human life is in jeopardy. Furthermore, the bread of the Eucharist, that which is blessed and broken, is a potent sign we call it a sacrament, that this most elemental stuff of the earth is infused with holy mystery. Bread also connotes cash, the symbol by which we enter the economic world of credit, debt, interest rate, budgets, tax incentives, market management, and significantly, the high cost of neighborliness. So there at the table of our Eucharist lie issues to do with the life sciences, social sciences, theology, and economics. And if you are not persuaded by the reference to economics, you may remember that just after the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark, the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Whereupon Jesus cautioned them with the words, Watch out! Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. That is to say, the religious and secular power structures of the Mediterranean world. We meet together because our common work is rooted in several faith traditions that hark back to manna bread. We become aware, I hope, that all bread is wonder bread. That's Brueggemann's phrase, wonder bread. And all bread is laden with sacramental significance. It is our Creator who gives bread to the eater and to the sower, the same whom we confess inhabits the bread in ways that we cannot articulate. And consequently, none of the widespread views of our faith, communities, can escape an accountability given by the very bread itself. For as Walter Brueggemann noted, bread is the guarantee of life to the neediest, the least, the last, the most precarious, the ones without leverage or claim or resource. All these issues are on the table when we hear the primal verbs of faith to take, to bless, to break, to give again. Amen.